Hello, everyone. Welcome back to International Trade. I'm very excited today to start a new lecture with a new model. It's going to be the specific factors model. And so let's begin. So the motivation for this model uh, comes straight out, out of the uh, limitations that we also discussed a little uh, of the actual lean model. In the actual lean model, we said the factors of production are fully mobile across industries. So labor and capital can freely move from industry one to industry two. Okay. So if there is a trade shock, say Denmark trades with China, Denmark starts producing more of the capital intensive good, workers and machines can freely move from the labor intensive good to the capital intensive good. Uh, we mentioned that this perhaps is not so easy for capital owners, right? maybe not as easy as it is for labor, although there could be some retraining involved, right? And perhaps that retraining is not, uh, would require, you know, going back to college, right? So what we're going to do in this model is abandon the idea that industries, uh, the workers, or in general, factors of production are fully mobile across industries and see how the effects of trade on factors of production and the effects of changes in the factor endowments will change. You probably remembered what happened last year with the mink production in Denmark, where uh, the Danish government uh, de facto uh, determined that uh, mink production was no longer uh, possible to do in Denmark. Uh, aside from uh, the political controversy and uh, the scandal that that choice uh, brought about, what this policy choice caused was basically a reduction in the stock of capital in uh, the mink fur production sector. Okay, so all minks have, uh, uh, have died. All the capital that's left here are, you know, the cages and everything else. So there's a huge blow into mink production workers in mean production can presumably move easy, easily to other sectors, whereas the capital owners in mean production are in a tough situation, right? Because their capital is immobile, really. I mean, I have heard that perhaps you can repurpose the cages, you know, for chicken production maybe, but that seems uh, still very hard. And so the specific factor model that we're gonna study today is uh, very appropriate to understand the effects of the political decision of terminating mink, fur, uh, mink farming in Denmark. Now, more generally, the specific factors model is uh, part of a chapter in which uh, we explore um, what happens when we have uh, more than the two by two uh, model that we studied so far, where we have two goods and two factors of production. Uh, we're just gonna focus in, in the course on the specific factors model, but just know that there, uh, you could have a more general model where you have N goods, M factors of production. So we index the goods by I, the factors of production by J, and we're gonna denote the endowments by VJ. I pay the way paid uh, a reward, WJ, anyway, regard, depending on whether the factor of production is labor or capital or other such things, the reward will become a wage or a rental on capital. Now, the equilibrium conditions will remain the same. Hey, the, we're going to have a zero profit condition so that the price equals the unit cost of production because we're in perfect competition. And that's going to be true for all goods N. Then if we differentiate this, like we did in the stopper samuelson theorem, we obtain that uh, the percentage change in price P hat I equals the uh, weighted sum of the percentage changes in the factors rewards WJ hat weighted by the cost share of factor J on the production of good I, and that is theta IJ. This is a very important condition because uh, oftentimes in, the, uh, in today's lecture, for instance, or in future lectures, 
and in the problem sets and perhaps in the exam, will be interested in studying the uh, relationship between uh, prices and factor rewards. And sometimes it is not given to you a zero profit condition, okay? You should immediately think when, uh, when, it, when, it's come, when it's the time to evaluate the effects of changes in prices on the uh, factors rewards or any other changes on the factors rewards, what you want to do is look at the zero profit condition, differentiate it and obtain this equation and see if that can help you. Then the full employment condition is just a summation over all goods of the, sorry, overall, yeah, overall uh, goods of the unit factor requirement for that good, AIJ for factor J, which depends on W, it should be a bold here. So a vector of all the rewards times the output for that good that must be equal to the total endowment of the factor of production. Okay, now today it's a specific case of this more general model. And as we will see, there's gonna be quite a few differences with respect to what we saw last time. And thing become, things become even more complicated when you go into multiple factors of production and I mean, more than three factors of production and more than two goods. Now, just want to give you a little spoiler here that in the future, we're going to uh, look at, uh, we're, we're going to basically expand our basic trade model along these dimensions. Now, there is a long literature that studies uh, international trade in the context of many goods. There is a very famous Darmosh Fisher Samuelson paper uh, where they have a continuum of goods. And that's something that you study in your master course of advanced international trade if you wish to take it. Now, in this course, we're actually going to look at a model with many goods. And this will be the Krugman and the Meditz models. And this will uh, be in just a few uh, video recordings, okay? And then we're going to have a continuum of differentiated goods. Now, in terms of factors of production, we have, uh, we're going to see in this course, the model by Finstra and Son of offshoring, in which there is a continuum of intermediate goods. And so we can think uh, that we're going to have a model with a lot, of it, a lot of inputs, right? A lot of factors of production in a way. They combine together in a final good. And that's actually in the next lecture in the model of offshoring. But I, I wanted to know here that, I want you to know here that there's a lot of research nowadays uh, that actually looks at uh, heterogeneous workers, meaning workers that have different abilities and how trade affect those. And this perhaps can be in the master course. And finally, we haven't really talked about it uh, so far. So far, we had a model with only two goods, uh, sorry, we, yeah, two goods, two factors of production, and most importantly, two countries, home and foreign. So you can think of that as, say, Denmark with the rest of the world, right? or Denmark with its, its most important trading partner. Now, that's very useful conceptually, but quantitatively, you can imagine that it's not a very useful model to bring to the data, right? But there are such models that allow for uh, that allows for uh, many countries. A very famous one is a multi-country Ricardian model, which is basically uh, was the foundation for the article by Gobert and its cocky that you read for a lecture one on the Ricardian model. And this is something you'll cover in the master course. In our course, we're going to look at an extension of a few models with many countries, but that's going to become apparent when we study the gravity equation. And that's going to be in a few weeks. Okay, so this is a short overview of uh, uh, what's going to happen in the future. We're going to expand along these dimensions. But now let's go back to the specific factor model. We're going to start with the main assumptions as always, and then we're going to revisit all the theorems that we studied last time, or almost all of them. We're going to revisit the stopper samuelson theorem, and then we're going to revisit the Rybzinski theorem. 
So let's start with the main assumptions. Two countries as always, although we're really just gonna focus on one country, the home one. Two goods indexed by I, three factors of production. I saw one factor of production is labor, which is mobile across the industries. Okay, so this is, I guess, easy to imagine if you think about uh, either high skilled workers, say managers, it doesn't really matter which sector you're in, right? or perhaps even low skilled workers, so say if you're a you know, blue collar worker, if the skills required for the job in two sectors are not that, are not that, uh, do not require long time uh, to learn, you can easily move, right? You can easily move from an assembly line to another, producing very different things if the skills involved don't require, you know, years of training. And obviously, it's more difficult to think about uh, labor mobility when we think about, I don't know, doctors and uh, chemical engineers, right? However, we're going to think that capital is going to be immobile across sectors, meaning there's going to be two types of capital, one that is specific to industry one and another one that is specific to industry two. The typical example here would be a sector which is agriculture and the other sector which is manufacturing. You see, one type of capital is uh, manufacturing capital, machines for production, even computers if you want. And the other capital is, uh, you know, harvesting machines, uh, tractors, right? Which I see often between uh, Viborg and Aorus. Okay. Now, as always, there's no movement of factors of production across countries. We're always going to have uh, same identical consumers across countries. We have perfect competition. And finally, countries are going to have the same production technology and they're going to differ in their endowments, just like in the actual lean model. Okay. Production function is, as usual, defined by this function f, which exhibits decreasing returns to one factor. And this will play an important role here. And in this lecture, we're not going to look at unit costs, we're just going to look at the production function. And you can see here the full employment conditions. We have three of them. We have uh, workers in industry one plus the workers in industry two must be equal to the total number of workers. And then the two specific factors of production equal to their used equal to their endowments. Now, the reason why we show the specific factors model is that it is uh, very uh, easy to characterize everything graphically. And so it provides a lot of intuition with just a simple graph. Now, the graph is going to be a combination of the labor demands in such a way that we can characterize the equilibrium of the model with just two lines. So the labor demand, let's plot the labor demand for the two industries. Right? So we have for industry one, we have a declining function. Why is it declining? Well, wages are equal to the value of the marginal product, so the price times the marginal product of labor. As you increase the number of workers, you have decreasing returns to the workers, and so the marginal product of labor becomes smaller, and therefore the labor demand declines. Same thing for industry two. And then the particular of uh, this type of models is that so long as you're producing both goods, which you will, the wage in the two sectors must be equal to one another, right? Now we can actually do a little trick here and combine these two labor demand functions in one graph. How are we gonna do that? First of all, redraw the labor demand for industry one. Okay, so there you go, very fast. If you wanna do it with pencil and paper, just pause and do it yourself. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna limit the size of the horizontal axis to the total number of workers. Okay, so that if you start from the left from point zero, going to the right, you are increasing the number of workers in industry one 
but that's gonna end when uh, you have employed all the workers in the economy, al bar. At that stage, what you're gonna do is, well, draw another uh, vertical axis, write another origin here, and think that when you go from the right to the left, you're gonna increase the number of workers in industry too. So, so if you are at the extreme point on the right, that means that L bar is uh, employed full in industry one. As you move to the left, there's gonna be a larger share of workers in industry two and a smaller share of workers in industry one. And if you're producing at the uh, point the, on, on the left, uh, the origin of axis on the left, basically all workers will be working in industry two and none of them will be working in industry one. Okay. So having done this, we're gonna draw the labor demand for industry two right, accordingly, which is basically a mirror image of what we saw before. Okay. There you go. This is the labor demand for industry two, right, with the origins here on the right. And this is the labor demand for industry one with the origin on the left. Why is this useful? Well, this is very useful because at the intersection of the two labor demands, the wage is the same in the two sectors. And so that means that that is the equilibrium wage. And so given the prices P1 and P2, the wage is determined graphically by the intersection of these two labor demands. See here we're running L1. The segment from zero to L1 is the number of workers in industry one. And from L1 to zero on the right is the number of workers in industry two. Right, so this is the beauty of the specific factors model. We can study a lot of things just with this simple graph. So let's start by revisiting the stolper samuelson theorem. I right, saw so in the stolper samuelson theorem uh, in, the, in the previous lecture, we studied that what are the effects of a change in prices on the factors of production's rewards. That's what we wanna do today right, in the specific factors model. In particular, we're gonna assume that the price of good one increases while the price of good two remains constant. Right, so price of good one increases, what's gonna happen? Well, if the price of good one increases, looking at this figure, you know, the price of good one affects the labor demand in industry one. So if the price of good one increases, labor demand shifts upward. Why is that? Well, because the value of the marginal product of labor is not higher. And so if nothing changes and all of a sudden the price of good one increases, no workers move, everybody remains there. You know, each worker is producing the same amount of units of good one as before, but now the price is higher. So given a number of workers, your wage is also gonna be higher. If the wage in industry one is higher, that means that all workers from uh, uh, industry two are gonna see that and gonna think, wait a second, I wanna move to industry one as well. I wanna earn a higher wage. And so as workers from industry two move towards industry one, what happens is that we move, say we're at this point here, we're gonna move down the labor demand. Workers move from industry two to industry one the marginal product of labor in industry one declines because there are more workers in industry one. And so the equilibrium wage will be determined by the intersection between the new labor demand for industry one and the old labor demand for industry two. Okay. Notice that the wage increases in both sectors. Okay. Why is that? Well, in industry one, we saw it, it is because you have an increase in price. So that increases the value of your marginal product and the increase in the number of workers in industry one from L1 to L1 prime is not enough to offset this effect. But the fact that workers from industry two move to industry one 
also means that there are more machines per workers in industry too. So workers in industry two are now more productive. And so they're gonna high, they're gonna earn a higher wage. Okay. Excellent. So we see here that you know, the an increase in the price of good one increases the wage. Uh, does that mean the workers are better off? Well, we don't know. We don't know. How is that possible that we don't know? Well, we know that the wage increases, but we know that it increases by less than the price of good one. So you earn a higher wage, but actually you can buy fewer units of good one. Is that, is that bad? Well, the price of good two did not change. So if your wage increased and the price of good two is constant, you can buy more units of good two. And so, are workers better off? Well, in general, we're gonna say that there is an ambiguous effect on workers. And this ambiguity is driven by consumer preferences, okay? In other words, if consumers predominantly consume good one, they're gonna be worse off. If consumers predominantly consume good two, they're gonna be better off, okay? The fact that the effects of a change in the price of good one are on workers are ambiguous is actually very interesting because recall the actuary model or even the Ricardian model, trade brings about a change in prices. Right? Typically your competitive advantage good becomes more expensive, hence you will export, produce more of it and export it. But so uh, the fact that this change in price has an ambiguous effect on workers, which depends on their, on their preferences or on their consumption baskets, obviously is very interesting because uh, you can think that uh, economists or even policymakers may be interested in knowing uh, which workers uh, gain or lose uh, when there is a reduction in trade costs or when countries begin to trade. And so in this article, which you were not supposed to read, but you're welcome to look it up if you're interested in. This is by uh, Jason Furman, Katie Russ, who was uh, at Davis during my PhD. And, uh, and then the last few years, she was at the Council of Economic Advisor under Obama. And then Jay Shambaugh. They show that actually tariffs are a regressive tax. What does that mean? That means that when uh, the United States imposes tariffs, so it makes it more expensive to import goods from abroad, well, that is regressive. That is affecting poorer people the most. As you can see in this figure, the tariff burden is much higher for the lowest decile of uh, household income. So for the poorest consumers in the US. Now, this is very interesting because this is implying that uh, consumers differ in how much they buy of say, goods from abroad. And poorer consumers, as a percentage of their income, tend to buy more goods from abroad than richer consumers. And you may think, why is that? Well, there could be several reasons. One reason is just the richer consumer save more. And so as a proportion of their income, poorer consumers consume more. And so even given the same share of consumption, poorer consumers just are more exposed to trade because of that. And the reason is perhaps the richer consumers consume more of non-tradable goods. Think of an expensive dinner and a fancy uh, Michelin star restaurants, restaurant that is a non-tradable good. It doesn't, obviously some ingredients might be imported, but that's not the point. But so you can imagine that these non-tradable uh, goods are perhaps purchased more by the richer consumers. Okay, but so this is very interesting because it puts a new light into the effects of international trade on workers. We saw last time with the actually model that trade between say Denmark and China, because China is labor abundant, Danish workers will be worse off. Uh, but if Danish workers, 
say they're poorer relative to the Danish uh, capital owners. Well, if the Danish workers predominantly purchase goods from China, right, the effects of China entering the trade will actually be ambiguous on the workers, right? Because on, their, on the one hand, their wages will be lower, but if they predominantly purchase tradable goods coming from China, whose price is now lower than before, well, that is actually a positive effect. So obviously in the news, uh, the effects of trade on jobs is uh, perhaps understandably more uh, widespread, but if we think in purely economic terms, we think about the changes in real income for workers. Well, we know from the extra lean model, workers will be worse off if we think of Danish workers or US workers and the trade with China, assuming that China is labor abundant. But then from the specific factor model, we know that trade might have uh, an ambiguous effect uh, and the evidence is suggesting that poorer consumers predominantly purchase goods from abroad, which become cheaper when countries start trading. And so this is a new channel on the effects of trade on uh, income inequality and is, you know, has been much ignored in the literature. Only in recent years we've started to study this, uh, but because we have uh, good data to do so. Excellent. What about capital? Well, let's see that. Graphically, we have established that there is an ambiguous effect on workers. Since P at one is greater than W at one, W hat, and, and which is also greater than P at two. Right? So here we're using the hat notation that we use in the Axelrod model. Now, what about capital owners in industry one? Well, to understand what happens to capital in industry one, it is uh, useful to consider the expression for the rental on capital in industry one. Now that the rental is equal to the value of its marginal product, so that R1 equals P1 times the marginal product, F1K, K bar one, L1. So what happens here? Well, we know that the price of good one increased. We also know that because of that workers moved to industry one. And so now in industry one, each machine has available more workers. So that means that the marginal product of capital in industry one is also higher. And so this means that the rental on capital increases not only that it increases, but also that it increases higher than the change in the price of good one. So capital owners in industry one are better off. So the specific factor in the industry in which the price increased is better off. What about capital owners in the other industry? As before, let us write the formula for the rental on capital here. In this case, we know that the price of good two remained constant also not the number of workers in industry through decline. And so there's fewer workers per machines in industry too. And as a result, uh, the marginal product of capital also declines. So this means that the rental on capital in industry two uh, decreases right? and decreases more in absolute term than the change, which was zero of the price of good two and the price of good one. So what this means is that capital owners in industry two are worse off. So we have an ambiguous effect on workers 
capital owners in the industry one are better off and capital owners in industry two are worse off. All right, time to revisit now the Rybzinski theorem. First, we're going to study the effects of an increase in L, holding constant the number of units of capital in both sectors. Okay, so how we're going to model this? Well, an increase in L is equivalent to having an increase in the size and the length of the horizontal axis. And so we remember that we saw that the horizontal axis is as long as the number of workers in the economy, the labor endowment. If we have an increase in that, we're basically going to draw redraw this graph with a longer horizontal axis. So that's how we do it. There is a change in L, which expands the horizontal axis. And then we're going to redraw the labor demand. Okay, so the, basically we're shifting to the right labor demand for industry two by the amount of the shock in labor. Okay, so the, basically this segment here, L2, is the original number of workers that was working in industry two. Now we have these extra workers represented by delta L. Where are they going to work? Well, some of them are going to go to industry one. Some of them are going to go to industry two. Now you see that the number of workers in industry one increases from L1 to L1 prime. And the number of workers in industry two also increases. Now it used to be L2 and now it is L2 prime. Okay. Now, what happens to the wage? The wage declines. What? Yes, it does. Migration in this specific factor model, holding constant the prices of final goods, right? P1 and P2, like we did in the Rybzinski theorem in the, stop, in, uh, in the actual in model. Well, migration reduces the wage. Why is that? Well, because an increase in the number of workers is going to decrease the marginal product of labor in both sectors yeah, because there are going to be fewer machines for each worker. And so the productivity of each worker will be lower. And as a result, workers will be worse off. How about the capital owners? Well, Capital owners are going to be happy with migration. Why is that? Well, each of their machine is going to have more workers working on it. So each machine is going to experience an increase in their marginal product. So the marginal product of capital in industry one increases and the marginal product of capital in industry two also increases. As a result, we can say that an increase in L makes workers worse off but capital owners better off. Okay. Now you may wonder, how can we reconcile this with the actual lean model that we saw last time? Well, a way to think about this is that um, the actual lean model is a long run model, while this, the specific factor model is a short run model. In the short run, capital cannot move, and so if there is an increase in L or a change in price or anything, you can examine what happens in the short run with a specific factors model. But then in the long run, when capital owners are able to disinvest in one industry and invest in others, well, then capital will be mobile across sectors. And then in the long run, the predictions that you're looking for are the ones of the actual model. And so basically what you can think is that here we saw that increase in L holding constant the prices of final goods will reduce the wage and increase the rental on capital. Uh, as a capital becomes mobile, okay, imagine that capital will probably move to the sector in which its marginal product is higher. Okay, so the labor intensive sector perhaps. And as a result, the effects of this increase in L will, uh, will be canceled. And then we'll go back to the Rybzinski theorem of the actual model. 
Now, finally, let's look at the Rybzinski theorem again, but this time we're going to see an increase in K1. Okay. So an increase in the capital in industry one. Now remember, we started this lecture with the example of the mink farmers. You can think that that particular shock can be thought through by a reduction in the uh, capital specific to the mink production sector. But in this case, let's uh, look at a more, uh, let's look at a different uh, example where there is basically a foreign direct investment, right? There's an increase in uh, the stock of capital in an economy. And uh, what, what, what is the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is straightforward, right? How are we going to do it? Take a few seconds to, uh, to think about it, maybe pause the video. You may wonder why these videos perhaps are short relative to a regular lecture. Well, that's because usually in class, we take longer pauses here to let you uh, find the answer. Right. Here we cannot do it, so I really recommend you that uh, when I ask these questions, you pause for a second, think about it, try and derive your solution and then check it. And that's the best way to learn. And unfortunately, this type of active learning activities are very difficult to do on video recordings without an incredible effort from your side. Okay, So I believe you can do it. Hopefully you did it. Now let's see. So if the capital in industry one increases, well, that means the workers in industry one are more productive. Right? So their marginal product will increase given the same number of workers, right? They're down more machines per workers than before. So the marginal product increases in industry one. Workers in industry two see that uh, and they decide to move from industry two to industry one that reduces the marginal product of labor, but it does not offset the initial increase. And so workers are better off. And so the wage goes up. This is wonderful. This is saying that in the short run, when capital cannot move, an increase in the stock of capital, whether it's driven by foreign direct investment or by other uh, increase in investments, that's going to increase the wage. And that's because the increase in capital will increase the labor productivity of labor in one sector. But since workers are mobile, workers from the other sectors can move there and that will increase the wage everywhere. Because as we saw before, when workers move away from industry too, the workers that remain have now available more machines for them. And so they're going to be more productive. And so their wages will be higher. What about the capital owners? Well, let's start with the capital owners from industry two. That's simple, right? Capital owners of industry two are going to be worse off. Why? Well, because workers move away from industry two. So if workers move away from industry two, that then means that the machines that are in industry two will have fewer workers available for them. As a result, they will be less productive. So capital owners in industry two are worse off. Workers are better off. Capital owners in industry two are worse off. What about capital owners in industry one? Well, the stock of capital in industry one has gone up and that decreases the marginal product of capital Right? Because given the same number of workers, the capital is now less productive. But then workers also move from industry two to industry one. And that has a partial positive effect on the marginal product of capital in industry one. So what happens to the rental on capital? Is it going to increase? Is it going to decrease? Is the effect again ambiguous? I'll try an answer to the question. Pause the video. Think about it. Right here, we're going to see, when I study what happens to the factors rewards, how we're going to do that. 
we're gonna do that with the pricing equation to the zero pro with the zero profit condition, as we said at the very beginning of this lecture. So let's see that. Well, it turns out that to understand uh, uh, definitely what happens to the capital owners in industry one, it suffices to use again our percentage change formula for the prices. So from our derivation uh, during the stolper samuelson theorem, we have that the percentage change in price of good one, p hat one, equals theta one L w hat plus theta one K r hat of one. Okay, so now we know that p hat one equals zero. We also showed graphically that W hat is positive. And so if uh, W hat is positive, uh, in order for P1 to be uh, equal to zero, it must be the case that R hat one is less than zero. And so capital owners are also worse off in industry one. All right. so. What are the main takeaways of this specific factors model? Well, first of all, factors mobility is very, very important. And so uh, just by assuming that capital cannot move between two sectors, we find very different predictions in terms of the super samuelson theorem and in terms of the Rybzinski theorem. You know, the super samuelson theorem generates ambiguous effect for workers with a specific factors model. So that means that when countries trade, uh, they will also have ambiguous effect on workers. And, and this will depend on the consumption basket of workers. And then we also saw that in the Rybzinski theorem, changes in factors endowments will actually have quantitative effects on the wages and the rental on capital. While in the actual in model, those did not change. Okay. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Ciao.